All right, I think we will get going. Um, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, for today's panel discussion on COVID-19 college campuses and contact tracing. Um, we're delighted to have a set of really distinguished and incredibly knowledgeable panelists today. Um, those panelists in, um, are Andrew Lover, uh, who is Assistant Professor of Epidemi Epidemiology in the School of Public Health and Health Sciences here at UMass Amherst. He's part of a UMass team that is designed and maintains the UMass Amherst COVID-19 dashboard, something which many of us uh, look at quite a bit, um, and a member of the UMass COVID Epidemiology and Public Health Response Groups. Um, he's also leading a team of UMass researchers who are studying the levels of SARS-CoV-2, that is COVID-19, for most of us, uh, exposure on campus and throughout Massachusetts. Uh, Kim Whedon is Professor of, so of the Social Sciences and Director of the Center for the Study of Inequality at Cornell University. Uh, in May 2020, she published the article, The Small World Network of College Classes, Implications for Epidemic Spread on a College on a University Campus in Sociological Science with Benjamin Cornwell, which documented the structure of enrollment networks that connect students and classes using enrollment data for more than 22,000 Cornell students. And finally, Prashant Chenoy is Distinguished Professor and Associate Dean in the College of Information and Computer Sciences here at UMass Amherst. He is Director of the Center for Smart and Connected Society, which released a new digital contact tracing technique that is based on widely deployed Wi-Fi technology. Um, and they intend, to op to intend the open source software tool to help universities and colleges deploy campus contact tracing as students return under special pandemic management rules. Um, welcome to the panelists and to our audience. Um, a couple of notes. We're going to start out um, with, um, with relatively brief 10 minute or so statements from each of the panelists uh, in the order that I introduced them. Um, and then we'll move to a question and answer session with the audience. Um, I may also ask questions that we prepared ahead of time, but we're most interested in questions from the audience. And um, to pose those questions, please use the Q&A function uh, in Zoom uh, to type your questions in. I will then see those and be able to, um, to order them and, and then select out questions to ask the panel, uh, which I will uh, then unmute uh, you in order to ask that question. Um, and then uh, we'll have the panelists answer and discuss. Um, also, please do note that this session is being recorded, so if you ask a question um, and engage uh, the panelists, that will also be recorded. Um, so uh, I think first I would like to uh, turn over the, uh, the mic to, uh, so to speak, to uh, Andrew uh, to start his, uh, his opening statement. Fantastic. Thank you everyone for coming. and. Um, giving me the opportunity to talk here about this um, incredibly complicated pandemic scenario. Um, so since this is a focus on data and trends and how we think about the data we do see, I wanted to show this. So this is a comparison of where the country was as a whole in July 20th and where we are today from a website called COVID Exit Strategy. And it's important to look here that um, all the states, each individual state is a single color. And that's potentially a little misleading because there's a lot of heterogeneity within individual states. And the metrics that they're proposing here in terms of um, uncontrolled spread or trending poorly are fairly arbitrary. But as you can see, there is um, an incredible amount of public health work that um, is really pressing um, throughout the entire country right now. So um, in terms of, there were, there were some questions in the, um, the prepared question statements about how we think about gating for moving forward or backwards. And so I've added these just to um, help um, populate some of that discussion. And, and the main metrics we potentially want to think about are new cases per day or on a population-based level, positivity rates, which you hear about um, daily in the newspaper, trends over time, um, and then really critical questions are about hospital and ICU capacity. And we're seeing several states um, in Midwest um, right now hitting really serious crisis levels um, in terms of um, their, their hospitalization usage. And finally, there's, there's several good metrics for suggested numbers of contract tracers per population. 
which is there. Okay, so a little bit about UMass and what we've been doing for the last six months or so. Um, UMass is fairly unique in the Commonwealth in that the Department of Health within the university is a standalone board of health, which is equivalent to all of the town-based boards of health. And so um, the public health nurses have direct access to the state data systems. Um, and we have two major sets of testing. Um, one is clinical cases at University Health Services. Um, and then the bulk of our testing is this asymptomatic testing that we started on August 6th. Um, so there's about um, 1,100 students living on campus and a larger number that have face-to-face -face classes but live locally. And then um, an even larger group that live locally but are doing all of their work online. And they just chose to live locally because they, um, you know, uh, leases and that kind of thing. So the, the people with the most face-to-face -face contact have mandatory twice a week testing and everyone else is once per week. Um, and two days ago, we just hit the milestone of 150,000 PCR tests total since November, since um, the start in August 6th. And then there's a daily check-in for um, people who um, may have missed an appointment or to make sure that they're, they're not missing um, their, their uh, suggested testing. And this is what it actually looks like when you walk in. Uh, there's actually a fantastic video down here if you really wanna see if you haven't been tested. Um, you walk in and you scan a card and they give you a barcode on the spot and there's plastic glass dividers everywhere. And then there is a nurse or a nursing student who's in another plastic glass barrier who watches you um, swab your nose twice, um, both nostrils. And then it goes in the cup and you walk out and it takes literally three minutes. It's, it's an amazing, amazing system. So um, the, the team there has done up to 3,200 tests in one day, which is just like truly incredible. Um, and just to focus a little bit, the, the contact tracing is not a new concept. Um, this has been kind of standard public health practice for decades um, for any infectious disease. So, so measles or a lot of sexually transmitted infections. Um, however, the U.S. has never needed to think about it um, on the scale or duration or complexity that we've been doing since, you know, March um, in most states. So it's, you know, really an order of magnitude bigger than, than anything that um, has been attempted before. Um, and some challenges in terms of um, both local and more general um, response. Um, so businesses and universities and the entire um, um, you know, public sector has really not had to think about infectious disease control and mitigation before. So environmental health and safety usually deals with you know, standard OSHA type um, responsibilities about um, falls and cuts and those kind of things. But in terms of restructuring the American workplace um, to deal with an infectious disease is really um, pretty new territory. Um, one of the, the other challenges is that um, all health data um, are generally covered under the HIPAA compliance rules, and this makes data portability really challenging um, across um, organizations and um, jurisdictions. And M Massachusetts is unique in the fact that it has more local boards of health than any other state. So even though we're not huge, we have 351 local boards of health. And so there is a really wide range in terms of um, the staffing levels um, and the facilities and just the general infrastructure from you know, very large, um, densely populated areas on the coast to much smaller towns here in the, the center in the west. And that structure um, really makes data flow and management and collaboration quite challenging. Um, so there's, there's several bills in the state senate and um, representatives to try and um, modernize that. So I, I recommend you digging into that a little bit. Um, last but not least, there's an expectation about instant and immediate data. So all of the, the COVID dashboards you can pull up online. Um, 10 years ago, that level of data was essentially impossible to get for anything. So that's both an, an incredible um, you know, new development that really helps response, but it also changes the expectation about um, how people think about data and expect data to, um, to present itself. 
Last but not least, there has been some um, fairly major complexities at the federal level in terms of how COVID data is handled and a shift from CDC to the Department of Health and Human Services, which um, really kind of disrupted the standard data flows um, that have existed for decades. So in terms of the um, UMass, the, the public health response team, um, there are four nurses and then 15 to 20 public health staff, undergrad public health students and grad students. Um, and several of those people worked full-time this summer doing contact tracing um, in Massachusetts and elsewhere. Um, and the really amazing thing is we um, have a median of about two and a half hours turnaround time from when a positive test is received to when the case gets a phone call and we begin contact tracing. So the, the state um, level um, mandate is 48 hours. So we're, we're well, um, well under that. And I just really wanna highlight the incredible work that this team has been doing. So um, a lot of the contact tracers are working 10 or 12 hours a day to make sure all the cases get called. Um, and that's, that's really been a major um, safety blanket for, for the community. Okay, and then really quickly, a few challenges that I think we're seeing um, both locally and nationally. Um, certainly pandemic fatigue. Um, people are having a hard time not seeing their families and doing all of the, the normal routine things that um, people like to do, which is not unreasonable. Um, marginalized communities have been heavily impacted um, both here in the Commonwealth and elsewhere. And that's very often due to multi-generational households um, where the, there may be a lot of service jobs. And um, so isolation and quarantine are much more difficult in, in a very complex household. And then last but not least, I really wanna highlight Thanksgiving. Um, the CDC just changed its guidance today to um, strongly, strongly advise avoiding all travel. So this, this plot here is the, the Canadian um, Thanksgiving, which is mid-October, and they saw an enormous spike in, in COVID cases um, shortly after that. So that's something I think we should definitely um, think about and discuss if, um, if there's time. And last but not least, um, this, this graphic popped up a bunch lately, and it's really important to think about the, the bubble that you may have in your head in terms of social contacts and, and minimizing those that assumes everyone in that sphere has an equivalent risk management. And the reality is that, you know, all of these circles overlap in ways that are hard to predict. And so really our best um, mitigation is to minimize all contact. So that's, that's a hard decision because we're obviously social people and social animals, um, but that's, that's unfortunately where, where we're at. Okay, thank you. I look forward to your questions. That was great, Andrew. Thank you so much. Kim. Okay. Uh, to the pandemic. Um, proving that no good deed goes unpunished. Um, that paper shortly landed on the provost desks, um, and I promptly landed on a COVID-19 planning committee. Um, and I'm currently working with the registrar to basically restructure um, Cornell's uh, fall 2020 or, or spring fall 2020 and spring 2021 um, course roster, which is a pretty complicated task. Um, the good news is it is giving me access to data. Um, so the, the project that I want to just talk very briefly about right now um, is based on fall 2020 data. So it is actually what was going on in these course enrollment networks um, during, the, during the pandemic. Um, and one of the impetuses for really thinking about this um, and why I think it's an interesting question um, is that um, I'm a sociologist. I love studying social interactions in social institutions. Um, but when you think about it, a lot of our major social institutions are really based on this assumption of face-to-face -face interaction. Um, and these institutions are having to modify basically how they do business, if they're a business, but um, how they kind of function as an organization um, to adapt to a viral disease that is spread by face-to-face -face interaction, right? So you have this tension between an institution is organized around face-to-face -face interaction and a virus that is, is spread that way, which is um, of course a huge, huge challenge. Um, and I think the challenge is particularly acute among colleges and universities uh, because they're in many ways structured to foster these ties among students. In fact, 
Um, that's one of the selling points that universities put out there about why you should learn in a university setting is that you can be surrounded by other people who are also learning um, and you can create connections across people who are very different from you, who come from different walks of life, um, and you can learn collectively, right? You think about all these kind of things we think about our, our assets in normal times in a university uh, really become a liability in a pandemic, um, especially one that's spread uh, through face-to-face -face interaction. So because everybody loves a, a network hairball graph um, uh, at any time of day, um, I've, I've shown you here um, the two networks. Um, these are networks of the students who are taking face-to-face -face classes um, at Cornell um, in, and the Ithaca campus of, of, of Cornell, the main campus of Cornell. Um, in fall of 2019, that was virtually all students. I mean, there were maybe three or four um, distance learning classes in fall of 2019. Um, by 2020, it turns out that only about 50% of our students are taking an in-person class. Um, part of that is because students, a lot of students didn't return to Ithaca, um, but part of that is that there are another four or 5,000 students who are living in Ithaca, but are not actually taking in-person classes. Um, so this is the structure of the network. Every single dot there that you see, the colored dots, um, our students. Um, there are roughly 22,000 of them in 2019. There are 11,674 of them, I believe, in 2020. Um, because there are fewer students um, this fall who are taking in-person classes, um, the color of the dot corresponds to a different field of study. Um, and I'm not going to talk about that just out of interest in time. Uh, but basically, uh, the orange there is STEM students, um, right? And they tend to cluster together and, and so forth. Um, and then there are also gray boxes. Um, if you can see them, they're kind of hard to see, but those are the courses that are connecting those students, right? So again, students enroll in courses, um, but they are tied to other students through uh, this kind of network of, of taking classes and, and taking classes with other students. So we can also um, just give you, I'll just give you a punchline summary of, of um, what these new data look like and how the network changed um, in, in Cornell's hybrid instructional model. Um, I should say that, that Cornell, um, like many universities, um, did adopt this, this mixed instructional model where some of the classes were online, um, some of them were in person, um, some of them were actually a mix of both within the same class, what we call a hybrid class. Um, all of the online classes or nearly all the online classes had a way for non-Ithaca-based students to take the course as well, right? Sort of a dual instruction mode, even within these quote unquote in-person classes. Um, instructors were given virtually a free choice about whether they taught in person or online. Um, and I think because of this high degree of autonomy, we ended up with um, a, a course roster where about 70% of the classes, um, and that would include discussion sections and labs and so forth, um, are online and only about 30%, 28% actually um, are in person or, or have some sort of major in person component. Um, and that's why one of the reasons why there are uh, fewer students in the in person uh, enrollment network as well. Um, so how did this, uh, this adaptation to the new world of, of COVID um, change this enrollment network among students? Uh, one of the things that we saw actually is, is more clustering um, by field of study. Um, and one of the things that's going on is that the very large courses of 50 students or more went online. Um, and those tend to be um, uh, courses that are uh, fulfilling requirements for a number of different majors, right? So calculus is fulfilling requirements for engineers and for biologists and for chemists and physicists and so forth. Um, it also meant that a lot of the general education um, introductory courses like Sociology 101, Introduction to Sociology went online. Um, and that just kind of changed the interaction patterns among the students. They're less likely to take courses with students outside their field. Um, you also had a little bit, I think, of, of um, kind of uh, departments were more likely to restrict enroll enrollments to their majors for various reasons having to do with classroom space capacity, actually. So there was more clustering by field of study. Um, there was also a lot less connectivity, right? So there were a, a smaller share of students who are actually in this network, uh, which I've alluded to already. Um, the students who were connected in that network tended to be connected through fewer different paths, right? So um, instead of just multiple ways that you could get from student A to student B, there might only be one way to get between student A and student B. So they were only taking one course um, together or with a common third student. Um, the, the paths between um, 
this is actually a typo in my slide, the pass between uh, the students actually lengthened by about a full step. So it went from two and a half um, steps to reach um, a, st a different student on average to almost three and a half. Um, and you see more degrees of separation um, connecting the, uh, the, the student pairs. Um, so I'll just give you this very quickly here. Um, one step would be if Kim and Ben are in the same class, right? There is, there's only one step between us. I mean, in 2019, 2.4% of all student pairs were connected by one step. Um, by 2020, that had dropped to 0.6% of pairs, right? There were just fewer students were sitting in the same classroom together is basically what that means. Um, the two and three steps are actually a little bit more interesting. So two step um, separation or two degrees of separation would be um, if I'm sitting in a class with Broom, that's VP Broom Park, um, and he's sitting in a class with Ben, Ben and I are connected by two steps um, but we're not actually directly connected um, in, this, in this particular formulation. In 2019, 59% of, of pairs were connected by only two steps. Um, in this semester, it's only about 10%, right? So a huge decline in connectivity. Um, and then you also see that at three steps as well, declining from 92% of pairs connected by three steps to only 55% connected by, by three steps. Um, we might ask, you know, these are, that's great. This is Cornell data, um, Cornell student enrollment data. Cornell is a very unique institution in many ways. It's part public, it's part private. It's located in Ithaca, centrally isolated and geographically obsolete Ithaca. Um, we might ask, is that experience kind of um, unique to, to Cornell? Um, in terms of the share of, stu of universities that said that they went to some sort of hybrid model, it isn't particularly unique. Um, so on the pie chart on the left there, I described from the Chronicle of Higher Education, um, about 21% of the nearly 3,000 colleges and universities in the U.S. said that they were doing a hybrid model this fall. Um, another 23% said primarily but not fully in person, and 34% said primarily but not fully online. Um, again, the categories between those three slices of the pie are pretty fuzzy, right? A, a university could report whatever they wanted. Uh, but the point here is that the majority of institutions seem to be some, doing some sort of a mixed um, instructional model this fall. Um, the other way that Cornell is a little bit unique, um, we do also have an asymptotic, um, asymptomatic, I knew I was going to say that, asymptomatic um, testing program, a surveillance testing program. Um, we test um, pretty close to 40,000 students a week um, and faculty and staff, right? So that's the bottom um, graph there. You can see the jagged edges. That's because there's um, very little testing that goes on in the weekends. Just a few students get tested over the weekends. Um, and you can see the number of confirmed positives up there at the start since August, um, August 16th. Um, we had an initial um, set of small clusters when the students first arrived. Um, so August 16th was actually before the beginning of classes and then it um, kind of the classes actually started on September 2nd, this, this one peak here. Um, but if you look uh, recently, actually just three or four days ago, there was a minor panic because it looked like we were having another cluster. Um, but just to give you a sense of the magnitude here, um, it was 14 students was the max or 14 people, this is students and faculty, um, were the max of this peak. Um, so Cornell has actually done very well in managing um, the virus. Um, and that can play out in these enrollment networks in the sense that um, there's probably been a lot less melt of students leaving Cornell um, or, or, change, or switching out of in-person um, classes into online classes because the university seems to be doing pretty well um, in terms of, of managing the, the pandemic. So I'll stop there. Um, I just wanted to flag the paper for you. Um, David actually kindly gave me a, a plug for it initially. I didn't know he was going to do that or I wouldn't have put in the slide. Um, the, the paper information there is on the right. It appeared in Sociological Science in May. Um, if you have praise about the paper, you're welcome to contact me, kw74 at cornell.edu. Um, all the critiques and hard questions really should go to Broom um, and, and Ben. So just keep that in mind as, as we go forward. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. I will have to remember that, that approach. I like that, uh, that approach. <laughs> All right, Prashant. Okay, so 
First of all, thank you for uh, this opportunity to participate in this panel. Uh, I'm going to take a technical and a technology view of this problem and describe uh, what technologies are out there, what uh, we have been doing uh, at UMass uh, in our group and, and more broadly, and then talk about the social implications of using these technologies uh, for, for COVID or uh, for other reasons. So let me uh, sort of give a quick background. I think uh, we already heard that uh, many campuses or particularly all campuses are having to do some sort of COVID-19 pandemic management. So what does that mean? Uh, many of the campuses have occupancy limits uh, that they're imposed on buildings and their labs and even classrooms. And uh, there has to be some way to figure out uh, compliance to make sure that social distancing uh, restrictions that are in place are being adhered to and so on. Uh, there is, uh, of course, a need to do contact tracing when uh, students, faculty, or staff test positive. Uh, and then there was also the question of who should be tested. Uh, but then by and large, most universities just decided that the answer to that question is everyone frequently. So, so I'm not really going to talk about that the third of those bullets, but I'm going to really focus on the first two of those questions and, uh, and uh, try to give you a little bit of a uh, glimpse into how we could use sensing technologies to answer some of those questions. And then we'll talk about what are the social implications of using these kinds of technologies. So let's start with contact tracing. So, so I presume all of you heard of the term contact tracing, if not uh, know about how it works. So basically, as, as Andrew mentioned, this is not a new technique. It's been around for decades. It's used in public health to figure out when somebody comes down with an infectious disease, uh, who have they been in contact with? So you can figure out who else might be infected and try to uh, somehow either contain the, the, the spread of the disease. Uh, so, so this has been a largely manual process for, for decades uh, using interviews and surveys and things like that. Uh, with uh, the emergence of COVID, there has been a lot of work and a lot of interest in using technologies to somehow address this problem, to scale it or to do what may not be possible manually. And uh, by and large, most of these techniques have used uh, smartphones, which are ubiquitous now, and uh, use smartphones to somehow help with contact tracing. The most common method is actually to use uh, the Bluetooth uh, capability of your phone to help with contact tracing. And, and uh, if you have a phone that has an um, uh, updated version of either Android or iOS, uh, this is now built into your phone. Okay. So how, how does it work? Uh, so by and large, uh, if you are going to use the Bluetooth method, you first have to opt in. So you have to go into your settings and turn this technique, uh, 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 to turn contact tracing, or it's called exposure notifications in iOS, you have to turn it on. What happens then is your phone essentially uh, generates a anonymous identifier and broadcasts it over Bluetooth. Uh, and then it also listens for other broadcasts in its vicinity. And the idea is if you are around some people and their phones are broadcasting and your phone is listening, you essentially have a log of who you have been uh, in, either in contact with or who has been in the proximity of your phone. So uh, now if someone actually tests positive, uh, you can essentially use uh, a public health officials to, to say that this anonymous identifier has actually uh, tested positive and then your phone, since it has a log of everyone you have been in contact with, can check if you have been uh, exposed. So, so that's how Bluetooth technology works as far as contact tracing goes. Now the problem that, that uh, we have had with this technique is that it requires a critical mass of adoption before it is effective. Uh, even before it was built into the OS, uh, uh, countries like Korea and Singapore tried to essentially roll out apps that did this. The problems were people wouldn't download the apps. If they downloaded the app, they wouldn't actually turn it on, the capability. And uh, the, the research showed that 
at least two thirds of the population has to turn it on for this to be effective. Because if you have the technique technology in your phone, but you haven't turned it on, it doesn't matter if you are uh, going to be in, uh, in the vicinity of someone else, they, their, their phone wouldn't be able to know that. So that's been the problem with the Bluetooth technology. So we've come up with an alternative method to do this, which uses Wi-Fi uh, rather than Bluetooth. Uh, and it uses the Wi-Fi network uh, rather than just using the phones to do this. And there's a picture here that I'm going to uh, use to explain how the Wi-Fi technology works. And the idea is somewhat similar to Bluetooth, but uh, it uses a slightly different technique. Uh, so you assume again that uh, users have phones that they carry with them. And we also assume in this case that the phones connect to a Wi-Fi network, which essentially means that this technique only works in environments like college campuses that have ubiquitous Wi-Fi coverage. Uh, so the idea is you, when you are, uh, when your phone is connected to, to the Wi-Fi network, it usually connects to an access point and the access point makes a record that the, the device is connected to it at a certain point in time. Uh, and the access point would also serve other users who are connect, whose phones are connected to that access point. And so you have a record of uh, who is connected to what access point at any, any instant. And as you move through your uh, through the campus or move go from uh, one floor of your building to the other, your phone is automatically going to switch to a different access point that is closer than the previous one. And then that access point now has a record that you were actually in the vicinity of that access point. So in this case, uh, the, the location of the user is essentially uh, the location of the access point that they connected to. And then you can figure out if uh, in, this, in this example that the uh, dark gray user is assumed to have tested positive. So you actually have a record of where the user was at different points of, uh, over the course of the day uh, based on which access points they connected to. You also know what other users were connected to that access point at that point in time. So that gives you some indication of who were in the vicinity of that users. Now, I should note that this is uh, a little less accurate than Bluetooth, although accuracy of Bluetooth methods are still uh, in question in terms of proximity. We know that users have connected to the same access point, but we do not actually know just from that information how close they were to one another. They could have been uh, two feet apart or they could have been 100 feet apart and we just really don't know. So, so there is there's some error that's going to come based on this uh, lack of proximity information. But by and large, what, what this does is you now have a record of all the locations visited by the user, other users who may have been present at that location, and you can use that same information for contact tracing. And the idea would be, uh, unlike the Bluetooth method, which is really user-centric, that users have to opt in and users are sharing information, this is network-centric. Uh, so what does that mean? So if a user uh, essentially uh, is test positive, they, uh, go, they uh, go to the contact trace, uh, the, their case goes to the contact tracers, let's say at a university, and then they have to give consent saying, okay, I agree to, uh, to giving you information about where I've been and so on. And you can still do the manual process, ask all of the questions, but you're relying on the memory of the user to tell you every, every location they visited maybe in the past several days, which and there could be gaps in their memory. But if they also consent to using their network data for extracting the same information, you could actually go and look at the logs that have been uh, recorded by various access points and figure out precisely where they have been at what point in time and who else was in their vicinity. So, so it's a consent-based tool that is uh, that we have developed that is uh, used by health professionals. Uh, the data is not directly accessible to users, so it's not like the Bluetooth method, which is more peer-to-peer -peer where users are sharing information by exchanging anonymous tokens. So that's the technique uh, for contact tracing. The, the same idea can actually be used for occupancy tracking in buildings. Uh, if you have social distancing restrictions that say that uh, you, you can only have so many users in a shared lab or so many you, you occupancy limits on floors and so on, uh, you can essentially track that with the same 
Wi-Fi information because the number of uh, con connections of that access point. You of course have to correct for the issue where you might have multiple devices connected to the same access point. So you cannot count to a laptop and a phone as two users. It's essentially the same user that are connected to, to the AP. But so long as you correct for all of those issues, uh, you can actually keep track of what the building occupancy limits look like or uh, the course of a day and so on. So that's really the graph in the middle uh, where you can see that there is a peak during the day uh, when users start coming in and then sort of the, the number of users falls off in the night and so on. Now, uh, I, I'll show, uh, explain the first of the graphs to your left, uh, which is essentially the occupancy that was seen in a particular building uh, around the time when pandemic caused the universities to essentially send all the students home. And you'll see that that was around spring break at UMass and there's a very sharp drop in the number of users that are seen on a, a particular floor of a building. And uh, so you can essentially see the before and the after. And, and then uh, we, we have been tracking this over the course of the fall to see how the occupancy patterns have changed and so on. So, so that's the use of Wi-Fi technology to either help with contact tracing or uh, understand occupancy uh, patterns that you see in buildings and so on. Uh, let me now talk about the, the non-technical aspects of these, which are essentially the privacy and ethical challenges of doing something like this. So there are many issues that are quite thorny that come up when you deploy technology like this, right? So first of all, I think most users may not even think that when they're connecting their device to Wi-Fi, that they're leaving a trace of every location they visit, but the network can actually see because your phone is connecting to the nearest Wi-Fi as you walk around your campus and you're leaving a trace of your movements uh, over the course of a day. Uh, most networks actually log it, uh, but for by and large, these logs have been used for things like tracking down cybersecurity attacks, if, if there are compromised devices that connect and start attacking other devices, you use these logs to figure out what went wrong, what device was compromised and so on. So here we are using that exact same information to essentially do contact tracing or trying to track mon uh, monitor, um, track uh, occupancy limits and things like that. And that does raise privacy concerns about uh, uh, that we are actually tracking user movements and things like that. Now our tool has been designed carefully uh, with, uh, with, with privacy considerations in mind. As I mentioned, it is not that information not directly exposed to users. So you can't go and query who has been where and so on. It's really only available to uh, health professionals, it's consent driven and so on. But any of this data is prone to misuse and that's something we've got to keep in mind. Uh, and there's the broader question of the ethics of this data collection itself. So I mean, should this data have been collected by the network to begin with? Uh, our IT usage policy on campus says that uh, the network can collect this data for security purposes or other for tracking, uh, monitoring the quality of the network and so on. So, so at some level, if you opted into uh, connecting to the network, you opted in for this data collection, but uh, since this data is being used for all kinds of other in, uh, analysis, there are always ethical questions that actually come up. So, so those are, I, I don't have answers for those questions. I mean, I just wanted to uh, mention that these are things that we have thought about, but there are no clear answers of what, where you draw the line, essentially. Uh, there are of course many technical challenges of how do you use any of these technologies to reduce false positives and false negatives? The technology, whether it's Bluetooth or uh, Wi-Fi based is not perfect. There are visualization challenges, how to convey insights to campus administrator, health officials through dashboards so they can understand what is actually going on. Has the mobility on campus increased? Is this likely to uh, increase the, the, the spread of a virus just as we are seeing that uh, traveling during Thanksgiving can actually cause more spread. We have seen that more mobility on campus, which is the same kind of issue at a micro scale can also increase uh, spread and so on. And last but not least, we want to understand how to combine really low tech methods, which is wear a mask, use a soap, and the high tech methods of using this. But 
our high tech methods don't tell us if you're not wearing a mask. That would be nice to know, but we don't have an answer for that question yet. So with that, I'm going to stop here. I would like to acknowledge uh, all the students and postdocs in my group who actually did all of that work. Uh, Amit Trivedi, uh, Targal, uh, Amrita, Camelia, and Helen. Thank you. And I'm happy to take questions with the rest of the panel. Thank you very much, Prashant. Um, I wish we, the, the one thing I know that we always miss um, in virtual uh, Zoom meetings is applause, which is very difficult to do. But anyway, uh, thank you all for your, your thoughtful presentations. I, I'm going to start out, we have a couple of questions from the audience, but I'm going to start out with a question about, about sort of sources of data, uh, to what extent we have the data that we would really like to have. Um, traditional contact tracing, enrollment networks, Wi-Fi tracing all have challenges, all give us a, a, you know, a partial picture of things. Um, to what extent do these different data sources and perhaps other data sources complement each other? Or to what extent are there still you know, like major blind spots? And what's the wish list you would really, the kind of data you would love to have that we don't have right now? So I'll take a shot. Um, uh, and some of this is based on um, my work on the planning committee and the roster team um, as well, kind of on the grounds implementation of, of Cornell's um, pandemic response. Um, we uh, know quite a lot about what courses students are taking, right? There's a reason why Ben and now Barum and I studied enrollment networks. We know what courses students are taking. Um, we don't know whether they're showing up for class. Um, we don't know where they're sitting within a physical space, um, although this semester there's actually seating charts. Um, we know what dorms they're in, um, but we don't know where they're living off campus. Um, and in fact, um, we found uh, that Cornell doesn't actually know where the students who aren't living on campus are in the world, um, right? There is absolutely, because most students have their, their mail sent to their parents address or their guardians address. We don't actually know where they are. They could be living in Amherst for all we know. Um, we just, you know, we have, we have no clue. Um, and also, and there are kind of, um, we, Cornell does have information on extracurricular activities, but it's, you know, it's voluntary for the students signing up for mailing lists basically. Um, but what's really the challenge is, is putting all these pieces of data together. If you really wanted to know um, all of the contacts or the complete network with all the multiplex ties that connect students on campus, um, you know, the courses are just one itsy bitsy slice of it. You need all this other information. If it exists at all, it exists in bits and pieces and just the coordination of it is, is um, pretty uh, daunting task. Um, here, I think it can be actually combined with the, the newer technologies, the, you know, the cell phone and, and Wi-Fi technologies in pretty interesting ways um, that uh, Prashant talked about. Yeah, yeah I think I, there's, oh, sorry, go ahead, Prashant. No, no please, go ahead. Uh, I think there's, there's kind of two major data sources that we would love to see. One is, you know, a magical database that somehow pulls in all the different data we have on people from, you know, registration and voters and, and just like, the, like you mentioned, a lot of local addresses um, are difficult to find and people have their, their parents' mailing address. And um, so, yeah, there's a, the, the volume of data is huge, but it's in so many different compartments in different places, it's hard to cross-reference it. The other thing is um, COVID-19 is very unusual in the fact that its transmission is very over-dispersed. Um, so a very small number of people probably um, are responsible for the vast majority of transmission. So it's a kind of Pareto distribution. So 80, 20 or 70, 30, depending on who you talk to. Um, and it's kind of unclear whether that, that small um, subset of people who may uh, precipitate so-called super spreader events, how much of that is biological and how much it is social. So those people may just for, for whatever reason, um, excrete a lot of virus on specific days or they may be very socially connected or both. And so trying to understand um, the relative contributions and then um, potentially ways to, to target um, either of those, those um, aspects. But that's the, the data are, it's hard to imagine a study design where you would um, be able to find those data. Yeah, so I was going to say some, something very similar to what Andrew just said. So there are many different data sources getting hold of 
any of these is hard, putting them together is harder still. Uh, and then the other way to think about it is uh, information is rich on campus, but as you go off campus, you have less information where do students live or who they're uh, socializing with, you don't know. But on campus, uh, because of uh, things like Wi-Fi and ability to do certain things, you can track this. So, so there is fine-grained data, the scores grain data, the data is siloed in different places. So it's really a tough problem to put it all together. Uh, and I think that that would be great, but I don't think that's an easy task because the, each of these data sets come with all kinds of restriction, right? Health data is HIPAA, ed educational data is FERPA, Wi-Fi data doesn't actually come under either of those two, but then uh, it has uh, so much information embedded in it that you have to be really careful about how you do it. So uh, we have a question from Brant Chaikas about uh, what he refers to as the next war. Uh, so I will let Brant ask that question. Thank, thank you, David. Um, wow. So I framed the question, and, 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 and forgive me if this is a little um, kind of out of left field, but I framed it as we often fight the, ne fight the next war based on our experiences fighting the current war. Right now we're at war with a particular pathogen. And we know a certain number of things about this pathogen in terms of its transmissibility, its lethality, and so forth. And I love all the talks that I've heard today. And it made me wonder to what extent are we, and I'm glad to see this work going on, but to what extent are we optimizing our solutions based on what we know about this particular pathogen. And I'm kind of asking a question of, there's gonna be another pandemic in the future. There have been other pandemics in the past from the Spanish flu, the bubonic plague. And really I wanted to tease out from all of you, like of the, and how much of your work would stand the test of time or, or what is it about the particulars of this pathogen and the way it transmits and the way it kills that would make these techniques durable over time with future pandemics and what might we have to change based on the characteristics of as yet un unaddressed or un uh, unfaced future pathogens. That's my long-winded question. Anyone it's a very, to, it's a very good that? challenge. It, it's a very good challenge for all of us to, to think about um, all of our work in a greater context. Um, I think certainly there's, right now, there's a need for immediate crisis response for, for everything. I mean, we're, we're restructuring society on a daily basis to try and deal with this. Um, and, and, but in a broader sense, I think um, this has really highlighted the fact that public health has been underfunded for decades, um, especially in the US, but globally. Um, and having really strong um, local public health systems is kind of the one very general and, and um, Swiss army knife of, of response. Um, so I'm, I'm hopeful that this will catalyze some, um, some greater investments. Um, we'll see. I mean, so uh, there's been kind of boom and bust cycles for, uh, for decades. Thank you. That's a, um, that's a great question, uh, Brant. As I was thinking about it, um, I mean, you're absolutely right that we are, uh, particularly at the institutional level, we're doing things like implementing physical distancing in classrooms that will do absolutely no good for uh, a sexually transmitted disease. At least we hope exactly. that it right. wouldn't have any connection, right? <laughs> right. Um, uh, you know, so a lot of the immediate institutional responses have been very particular to this. Um, I mean, just thinking about my work, the, you know, the obvious answer is that um, these network ties matter, right? So if you think about the HIV epidemic, um, I saw Tony Pike was on the, the call earlier, um, but he was involved in a project based in the University of Chicago that was look, really looking at the sexual networks of men who have sex with men to try and study the spread of HIV, right? A very, very different um, problem to be able to, to try and solve, but fundamentally it was really about kind of melding um, the biological, the epidemiology, the population-based studies with really kind of um, 
network-based studies to try and figure out who people really are interacting with in, in what ways, whether it's sharing the same air or sharing something else. Um, but, you know, and I think that's a really good observation that we can't always be chasing the last um, pandemic. Uh, we, need to, we need to figure out how to um, build the infrastructure. And some of that is gonna be funding more positions like Andrew's um, to, to be able to deal with the next one. Um, yeah, great observation, Fran. Great, thank you, Kim. And I thought that reference to the HIV pandemic, you know, different forms of transmission. And for Prashant, you know, similar question for contact tracing. At what point, I could imagine certain scenarios where contract tracing has to happen without a human in the loop because you need the earliest possible notification of people who've been exposed. And because we've got, we can allow a certain time lag, um, contact tracing can be a little bit more at a deliberate pace. Or, or we don't even know we can do contact tracing for until symptoms materialize, which could take days. Right, so I think that automating these processes is not challenging. It can be done. Uh, the reason you want to be careful is the technology is not perfect and there will be false positives and false negatives. So you don't want to needlessly alarm someone uh, or uh, miss uh, someone important. And this is why the way we designed it for this particular use case was to combine it with the experts. But, but having said that, as the technologies uh, improve over time, you could automate it. One of the main reasons why uh, everyone is rushed in to do digital contact tracing is just scale. Because when we were talking to uh, people at uh, health services, they basically told us that they can essentially do maybe seven to 10 contacts per, per, per case and that's their uh, uh, limits. And if you think about it, if you're doing going to do face-to-face -face teaching, you go to a class and uh, if there's an infected uh, student there, you have essentially uh, maybe 50 contacts right there. And then over the course of a day, we found that you may be in proximity of maybe 100 to 200 other students. And mm -hmm. you just can't do manual contact tracing at that scale. Uh, so these technologies can help you scale that up, but there are still limitations because uh, we don't really have a good sense of proximity and so on. And But, but I'll also say this, a uh, lot of these technologies, as you rightly uh, uh, pointed out are designed for infectious diseases. In fact, we started this project actually in, uh, based on this meningitis outbreak that we had on campus two years ago. So we had started thinking about doing contact tracing for that purpose. And we had some of this built. So when COVID hit, we could uh, uh, you know, uh, use it for, for COVID. Uh, otherwise it would have taken us much longer to bring that, uh, bring all of these tools uh, to, to production. But uh, if this was not an infectious disease, then how do you deal with that? How do you get the social graph of interactions and what kind of interactions cause uh, spread of a particular disease? That's an interesting question. I think, uh, I think there's a long way to go before we can try to generalize some of these to many other kinds of diseases. Okay, great. I'm going to turn now to a question um, from Tony Peck. Uh, Tony. Hey there. Hi, Kim. Hi. Small world. Yeah, small world. Um, I guess so originally I was going to ask a question just to Kim alone, but maybe this is a question for everybody, um, which was, um, given the kinds of data that you're collecting, you thought about or tried adding some simulation to your modeling so you could look at potential COVID spread under various assumptions and maybe inform um, decision making uh, at your, in your universities or at UMass and Cornell. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Tony. Um, so the small world comment, uh, Tony and I were at University of Chicago, what, 20 <laughs> something years ago. Um, so the answer to your question is no, we haven't done that. Um, and the reason why we don't, haven't done that um, is because uh, we're not epidemiologists and we didn't want to play them on TV, frankly. Um, I mean, there are a lot of armchair epidemiologists out there. Some of them are doing enormous damage in the world. Um, 
and, and for various reasons. Um, so, you know, we felt, Ben and I felt um, that we just didn't have the expertise. Um, that said, there is a group um, on campus uh, that is really doing a lot of epidemiological modeling for Cornell. Um, what's interesting is that they're just making assumptions about the number of contacts that students have. We actually have data, at least on some of this. Um, so Prashant men mentioned, you know, 50 students in a class. In fall 2019, the average Cornell student encountered 529 other students through their class networks. In fall of 2020, that's dropped down to 65, right? So this enormous decline um, in the number of, of degrees in the network, recognizing that obviously this is just classes and not, not other things. Um, I mean, I think it's a, I think it would be a, a obvious next step. And Ben and I, quite frankly, had intentions to find somebody who could help us with this modeling and basically superimposing the network um, with the epidemiological models. I mean, there, there are actually tools out there to do that, but we just haven't kind of found the right, the right co-authors yet. Um, so that's an advertisement out there, by the way. So I, I did want to make a comment to uh, what Tony said. We haven't done simulations either, but we did do some what if studies of, of our, how our tool would work. Uh, exactly what Kim was mentioning, because what, what the, the uh, health professionals were telling us is they really like to focus on a small group of, uh, of contacts. And we really wanted to see how large that circle is for end users. And we, we, we looked at users with different mobility pattern and we came up with vastly different number of contacts that they had over the course of a few days. Anything from maybe tens to several hundreds is exactly what, what Kim was mentioning. And then the interesting thing was we did that after uh, students went home uh, over spring break uh, in, the, in, the, in the spring semester, but there were a few hundred students that were on campus. And, uh, and since there were no face-to-face -face classes, we could see that the, their circle has shrink, uh, shrunk to maybe 10 or 15. So, so you can actually figure out based on mobility patterns, what kind of spread you can see and so on. But we haven't done a systematic simulation. We just try to do some analysis to understand what the bounds are of what these tools can do for us. Great, so we have another question from Shreyas Ray um, about vaccines. So there we go. Oh, um, I, I was just uh, wondering whether like any plans would, you know, uh, change uh, based on what you guys have talked about um, after, you know, the newest like P Pfizer and some of the other vaccines have been introduced. And um, I, I'm not, I'm not too informed in all this, so I could be wrong, but like, uh, would it be, wouldn't it be more likely that uh, they would have been distributed to uh, at least some uh, proportion of the people uh, by next year? And how would that change like the procedures and uh, testing and like the number of in-person classing classes? Sorry, um, yeah. Yeah, certainly. I mean, the, the data from both Pfizer and Moderna are fantastic and kind of better than anyone hoped or expected to see. Um, the big challenge now is supply chains and delivery. Um, making hundreds of millions or billions of doses is really, really logistically challenging. Um, the, the best estimates I've seen are maybe 20 million uh, people vaccinated um, end of this year into the first quarter. Um, and that would probably be healthcare workers and um, other frontline, um, you know, uh, police and, and fire and all of that. Um, and then probably the elderly would be second um, and other vulnerable populations. So probably um, healthy young 20 year olds and, and you know, general university populations would be pretty far down the list. Um, so that, that will definitely, um, once vaccine levels get to a certain level, then, then certainly um, there, there would be a lot less need for um, widespread testing. Um, but I think uh, realistically, it's going to be quite a while to, to deliver that many vaccines to that many people. All right. Thank you. Thank you. 
So uh, I wanted to ask a question about um, kind of your personal experiences uh, as you've um, been been learning, you know, more about this particular um, virus, or in the case of Kim and Prashant, I suspect learning a lot uh, about um, about epidemiology and and disease and other things. Um, what has been what have been the biggest surprises, uh, the things that you uh, didn't know when you started into this, say in March, that you do know now? Um, and also, what are the things that other people think they know uh, that isn't accurate, at least not in, in your, your experience with the knowledge you've gained? So that's a... That's a really great question. Um, I mean, I saw it on the list and I was hoping that maybe he wouldn't get around to asking it. Um, I mean, I guess for me, uh, one of the positive surprises um, is that, uh, and I'm just gonna put a shout out to Cornell. I mean, I, I'm not part of the testing side of it, but they have done an absolutely fantastic job of testing. Um, and, you know, I was, I spent a lot of time um, on committees and, and kind of uh, one of the people in the background working on this, but I was kind of skeptical, frankly, that we were gonna be able to manage it as well as we, we have. Um, and I think the broader lesson here is that um, it is possible to reopen um, to at least some face-to-face -face instruction. And we're not 100% face-to-face, we're, you know, whatever I said, 70-30 um, online to face-to-face. To -face. Um, it is possible to do that safely. Um, I mean, I guess the, you know, the sociologist in me would point out that Cornell does have a lot of benefits that most universities don't have. Um, one of which is that Cornell has been able to invest $10 million a semester in testing, right? Um, that's a lot, that's a big chunk of change. Um, it's also the case that Cornell is um, isolated in Ithaca, New York, right? So it's a little bit easier to keep students from at least broadly um, traveling and, and um, going out. There's no train that goes to Ithaca, right? So it's a little bit of a production for students to travel in and out of Ithaca. Um, so, you know, I mean, I think that there are things that are unique about Cornell, um, but it has given me a lot of hope um, that with sufficient resources, we could make this safe even before the vaccine kind of gets around to those healthy 20 to 25 year olds. Um, although the faculty, you know, some of them are actually in that elderly age group. Nobody here, of course, but. <laughs> I think kind of the most important lessons we've seen are that most people and most students want to do the right thing most of the time. Um, but it's really important to provide alternatives. If you just say, you can't do this, you can't do that. Um, it's really important to provide constructive and, and um, you know, engaging alternatives. Um, so that's, that's been an important lesson. I mean, that's the decades of, um, you know, STI prevention and, um, you know, a lot of public health, you know, you, you've got to provide, you know, a, a viable alternative. Um, and, and secondly, just that, um, the, the, there's been a whole range of different responses from universities in terms of being um, very draconian and punitive for infractions. Um, there were some pretty, pretty um, you know, inflammatory emails sent out to students about having parties and that kind of thing. And that has really been shown to be very detrimental. And so I think that's, that's been an important lesson to everyone and that um, you know, this has to be a cooperative effort and, and a community engagement um, process instead of a, you know, top-down um, kind of uh, mandate. So I had a couple of observations to make uh, with regards to what you asked, David. So the first is, I think uh, uh, both Andrew and I were on uh, 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 the health and safety working group that was tasks, tasked to understanding what the testing needs were and what the contact tracing needs were, and we met over the summer. And I remember uh, people like Andrew saying, we have to test a lot. And, and when we looked at the numbers, they looked really high. And, and uh, the response from people who would be making the decisions was we just don't have that kind of capacity. The hospitals don't have that capacity. You certainly don't have that capacity. So it was really looking like we would be entering the fall uh, with, uh, with the understanding that we had to test a lot, but there was just no way to do it. And then uh, somehow 
I think we've managed to stand up this amazing testing facility at Berlin Center, which really has uh, run like a very smooth assembly line. I mean, as, as Andrew rightly pointed out, uh, it just takes minutes to get tested. And, and you have students coming there to get tested twice a week and, and things have actually by and large gone pretty smoothly. If you look at the New York Times college uh, coronavirus tracker, you will see lots of campuses have cases that run in the thousands. So more than 10, 15% of the student population has been infected. And, and it looks like UMass and, and Cornell from what Kim mentioned have actually done a much better job at, at uh, managing these numbers. So, so that was actually a pleasant surprise because I was expecting that bad things would happen going into the fall, given the lack of resources we had being in a rural area, not having a large hospital that could roll it out, but somehow the right decisions have been made and things have actually gone pretty pretty well overall. So, so that's one observation. Yeah, much like Cornell, there's been massive investment in testing. That's right. Um, that's right. I mean, yeah. Cornell has you know, a world-class veterinary lab that, that was, I think, really instrumental in um, even larger scale than, than we were at. But we also have a, a hotel where we're sticking the students who test positive. I mean, you know, this is talk about advantages, right? There's a hotel right on campus that's owned by Cornell. So, you know, that helps too with the other side of it. Yeah. Prashant, I'm sorry, I interrupted your no, second no. observation. I, I was just going to say my second observation was how people perceive technology. Because I think we are, as through the course of these interactions, I've seen kind of both sides of this, where people think technology is the answer and it's going to solve all the problems. And just have to put this app on the phone and everything is done. We have solved the problem. And then there are other people who are saying, this is not even going to work. Why are you even bothering with it? Right. So, I mean, I remember conversations with our uh, health services and contact tracers. And when I said, our uh, initial estimates show that if you ask us to run a report on any student, we'll give you a list of 200, maybe 300 contacts they have uh, sort of come, uh, the, the, so they have been in touch with. And they said, that's just not going to work. We deal with seven to 10. So we just don't think this technology is for us, right? And of course we went back and thought carefully and said, we can prioritize how we present this information and we can say, these are the more frequent contacts and we can help you give you the information in the way you want. But, but you could see that people are, uh, like you just think the technology is the answer, but we don't believe that. And then, and then we have the tech sector that believes everything can be solved with technology. So, so you've seen both sides of that in the course of this. So let me ask what I suspect will be our last question, uh, which is um, about you know looking to the future. Um, this is probably going to happen again. Um, you know, perhaps not at this scale, perhaps a different sort of of, of disease, but um, but we need to be ready for future pandemics. Um, and I I think one of the big surprises to lots of people, perhaps just people who hadn't thought about it before, but certainly to me, was the unique uh, vulnerability of universities uh, to a, a pandemic, in terms of the, the the you know the approach that universities take and 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 what we what we advertise as our strength. So, um, what should universities be doing to prepare for the next pandemic? Um, are there things to do to the business model? Are there things to to do to to say no, keep the business model the same? Uh, you know, change how we. Um, change how we respond to, to pandemics or do what we've done this time, but just be ready for it. What, what, are, what thoughts uh, do you or have you heard from others about, about what to do? Well, that's an interesting one. We haven't thought through how to deal with this one yet completely. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'll, say, I'll say this. Uh, we've been forced to do things we wouldn't imagine could have been done. Mm -hmm. Nobody expected that in one week, the, all universities are going to flip a switch and all classes go remote. And faculty have insisted that certain things cannot be done online and things like that. So, so I think there is a good and a bad side to it. Uh, the, the good thing is this is going to have other benefits. There will be more online offerings 
faculty will be more comfortable teaching hybrid classes or there'll be students in class and students remote. So, so I think education as a whole will be delivered in many different modes to a much broader segment than we have been doing. So that's, I think, the, the, the good thing. The, the not so good is, I think, uh, it has been hard. I mean, teaching courses that are hybrid, uh, dealing with multiple time zones, all of that has been challenging. And I'm only talking about the teaching challenges. Of course, there are a whole lot, bunch of other challenges there. So anyone who's taught these classes has found that not everyone has good internet connectivity. They've gone home and they're in, and then Asia, so you're off by 10 hours. And so dealing with all of that has actually become much more complicated if you're an instructor. So there is no good answer to how to deal with that because there is no, the world is not going to be all in of the same time zone, right? Our students will be dispersed everywhere. So there are all kinds of challenges that we never thought about that we'll have to encounter in the course of this pandemic. And then we'll have the same challenges next time if if we switch to remote and things like that. So I think as a as an sociologist, the um, the pandemic has exposed some of the real fragility of the system of higher education in the United States. Um, how much it relies on um, overwork, frankly, um, incredibly long work hours. Um, uh, that you know, I mean, faculty are exhausted, students are exhausted, staff are exhausted. I work with a lot of the registrar staff. They don't sleep, as far as I can tell. Um, but I think more fundamentally, it's exposed, um, you know, the the kind of the you, so many universities are caught between the scylla of declining funding, um, of needing those residential um, housing and dining dollars in order to keep functioning as a university, because we know that on a per student basis, you know, funding for education has been cut for 15 years in some states. Mm -hmm. um, I think Massachusetts is a little bit better, but you know, there's still there's still been pain. Um, so there's that scylla, but then there's the charybdis of this problem of, you know, maybe it would actually be safer if the students didn't come back to campus, right? So I think all universities wrestled with this. Um, and, you know, the Cornells of the world, uh, the University of Massachusetts of the world um, are going to be fine. Um, but uh, just next door, Ithaca College is um, cutting 25% of its tenure line faculty. Um, which is a huge, right? A huge cut. Um, now they had some financial issues before, um, but this hit in terms of the residential, the you know the the housing and dining dollars and the declining enrollments from students saying, no, I'm not going to spend that kind of money to, you know, take classes online. Um, I mean, it's decimating, right? So there, for every Cornell or UMass, there are lots and lots of colleges and universities like that that are really going to struggle with this. Um, I mean, I think it's going to hasten. Um, the decline. Um, I'm also, I tend to be a little bit more skeptical of these quote unquote disruptive educational technologies um, that are often touted. I think that, um, you know, that, that the face-to-face -face human interaction is so incredibly important to the learning experience. Um, and I think if we give that away and say, well, we can just go online, um, we're not going to be providing something that, that um, students necessarily want, their parents want to pay for, um, and, and so forth. So I'm a little bit more skeptical about that in terms of this being a kind of a moment to shift to online instruction. I just think it's um, uh, there, it's not, it's the huge inequities that Prashant um, pointed to um, are absolutely there. Um, we're learning more, there's more data coming out of um, the UK actually that's showing um, enormous, enormous um, declines in learning, particularly for students from historically disadvantaged groups um, in the shift to online, right? This is not a good thing. Um, so I think that that um, in terms of being prepared for the next one, um, I would hope that we could figure out a way to be on better um, financial footing um, so that if we do need to shut down, it doesn't mean kind of closing campuses and universities permanently. It can be more of a um, kind of a strategic as opposed to being caught between budgets um, and, the, and the pandemic and the virus. Um, so that's my um, uh, cynical or perhaps depressing sociological take on the situation. Andrew, any, any thoughts or? Uh... I think realistically, I'm just focused on trying to power through this next set of problems that are about I to totally drop on it. everyone's head. And then, yeah. um, you know, sometime next year when we have some, um, <laughs> some breathing room, we can start strategizing about 
you know, social safety networks and public health infrastructure and university. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah. Certainly things we need to think about. Um, but yeah. Absolutely. Um, well, I, I think that that uh, wraps it up in terms of the questions that we have. And I want to thank each of you so much. This has just been uh, been wonderful and uh, very different perspectives that are complementary and, and overlap in fascinating ways. It's, thank you for doing this um, and, 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 and applause uh, to, to all of you. Um, and I'm sure there would be would be large applause if we had uh, everybody who was unmuted. But thank you very much.